so the joke is, um, why can't Anglicans play chess? B because they can't tell the difference between a queen and a bishop. So The God Who Saves is a project that I conceived originally probably about 10 years ago. Um, I, the idea was, given some account of Christian universalism, what would this mean for all the doctrines of Christian faith? The book developed over time into something else, a little bit more than that, but essentially what the book is attempting to do is to sketch a different account of soteriology, salvation, um, and then flesh that out doctrinally through all the areas of systematic theology. Um, so it goes through the various doctrines of systematic theology, but it does it in a slightly different way. So I don't begin with Trinity, I begin with soteriology. Um, and then I go into Christology and pneumatology, to church, creation, and then finally Trinity at the end. Um, and that's the overall structure, but the th argument is e effectively um, the, the problem I'm trying to solve here is how do we understand the universal account of God's grace while at the same time acknowledging and affirming the concrete historicity and, and specificity of each person, so without denying each person's uniqueness and individuality within history. Um, so I'm attempting to reconcile those two worlds. Often you emphasize the universality and you lose, you lose the individuality or you, you emphasize the individuality and the freedom, but you lose the universality. And I'm trying to find a different way to reconcile the two. And I do that primarily through uh, a reworked version of apocalyptic theology, um, apocalyptic uh, with some existential theology from Boltmann. So that's, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do, um, the problem I'm trying to solve, and, uh, and so then I, I flush it out systematically. Right, so I call it a soteriocentric approach, um, and I do that because often in modern theology, especially after Karl Barth, we talk about a Christocentric theology. Um, and Christocentrism is important. It, there we just mean a theology that makes Jesus Christ central in our theology, and we order things back to him and around him. And that's fine, I'm, I'm in favor of a Christocentric theology, but the problem has been that that's not specific enough. You can, you can separate the person of Christ from the work. Um, and so, and, and then you start to, to lose your ground in what you mean by Christology. Is Christology uh, this person, uh, whether it could be a historical person in the past, it could be the eternal son, uh, what Christology are we talking about? Um, and so I specify the Christology by, by grounding it in soteriology. What does Christ do? Um, what's, what does he accomplish, his work? And I do that in light of Eberhard Jungel, who criticized Bart for, on this very point. So I'm following in that vein. But essentially what soteriocentric theology is, it means for me at least, is that there's an existential encounter um, that salvation involves. And so it's that particular encounter with God that the individual has that becomes the norm and orienting center for theology. So everything else revolves around that point, and that point is, is Christ in his present saving work today. So it's that account of salvation, which is Christology also, um, that becomes the central point for, for Christian theology. First, I would offer a clarification. I don't assume universalism so much as I defend it by way of articulating its systematic coherence. It's a, it's a slight but important distinction. I don't want to say that I'm simply assuming an account, because effectively the work as it is now is a defense of an account of universalism, but I'm defending it in a different way. Often what we do is we, um, we go after the universalism and go through all the various arguments pro and against. And I, I find um, a theology is um, defensible or, or at least persuasive uh, when, its, when its systematic coherence becomes clear, um, when the, the, ex, the explanatory power of, of, the, of the doctrine or the idea becomes evident. Um, and, and what happened for me is I changed my mind. 
So uh, at one point, 10 years ago, I had thought this book was going to be an account defending and articulating a very Bardian approach to universalism. That is an account that makes salvation effective for all in the past event of Christ. Um, as I did more work on Bart and on Boltmann especially, um, I became convinced that that wasn't a, a feasible solution. That, there was a dead end there for me. Um, so that thrust me back into this process of trying to figure out what do I actually think theologically. Um, and so the book went on this long detour for me where I had to actually work out piece by piece what my account of Christian theology was. <clears throat> and a large, a large part of that in in involved going back to Boltmann, going back to Bart, and just reconstructing things from the ground up. So for me, universalism, um, even though I began with that at the start of the book, um, I'm really developing an argument for it by showing that it makes sense in the, th in the totality of Christian theology. And that involves um, working out all of its implications. Um, so it, what happened for me was that I really needed to find some account that made sense of my individual particularity, my concrete existence in history. Um, I, I was no longer convinced by Bart's concept of humanity as a general category um, in which all people are um, included in Christ irrespective of what happens historically to them. What, their, their social location, their, histori their historical existence, their embodiment, all that. Um, and so I couldn't accept Bart's mechanism for arriving at a universal view of grace, but I knew the conclusion was right. I, I, that seemed convincing to me. Um, so the book is really an attempt to arrive at that conclusion, but by way of Boltmann and Jungle and those folks. Um, so in that sense, it's simultaneously a defense of universalism, but at the same time an articulation of its implications and showing how it makes sense of Christian faith and of scripture and the, and the totality of Christian theology. Yeah, so um, a big part of the book is this account of metaphysics. So um, uh, metaphysics for me is, is basically any conceptual schema that um, is, that identifies its object uh, apart from or, or prior to a consideration of its location in history, its historical existence. Um, so that might be an account of God, um, uh, where we talk about God in, apart from uh, you know, God's action in history, a revelation in time, um, where, where we're speculating about God's imminent life or something like that. Um, or it might be an account of human persons where we we trade in concepts of human nature in the general, in the abstract, and, and we kind of assume that this notion of human nature um, actually describes and includes real people and concrete individuals. Um, so that kind of, that generalized talk of both God or human persons um, is what I, I identify as metaphysics. And, and that's, those kind of concepts are generally are what we use in universalizing discourse. Um, and universal salvation accounts tend to assume something like that. So whether it's origins, a concept of you know, the rational mind, you know, the logos, or it's Bart's account of, of human, human nature um, that we're all included in Christ um, uh, by virtue of election. Um, there, there's always different accounts of doing that, and they tend to, at some point, abstract apart from history. Um, so. My, my counter approach to that is a hermeneutical one. So hermeneutics for me is just the opposite of metaphysics. Hermeneutics is an account that identifies its object um, in connection with its concrete historicity. So whether it's the text, reading the text historically, um, understanding the, his the historicity of the object as well as the subject who's actually knowing that object. Um, and that then if we, if we take the hermeneutical approach, that has implications for how we think about theology. Um, and so, so the hermeneutical big point of origin for my book is, that's my prolegomena, I go then from there into the actual soteriology. So soteriology, salvation, I have to reconceive that in a hermeneutical, historical way. Um, so that involves uh, understanding salvation as something that's uh, an event that that's part of my existential life, my existence in time and space. Um, 
insofar as I am encountering God, that encounter is that event of salvation. And then that event becomes the, the, the point of, you know, it's the point of revelation that then illuminates our theology, how we understand God and how we understand ourselves and the world around us. Um, I've been done, doing a lot of work on Boltmann for, for a number of years now. I wrote a, a large book on Boltmann, but it was very dense, uh, very, con uh, very technical. Um, I wanted to provide a handy point of entry into Boltmann for those who hadn't really read him, or maybe had only encountered him through one essay or uh, had heard about him in a textbook. Often the approaches to Boltmann tend to do the kind of usual, you know, the early history, here's the main text, that, that kind of thing. Um, what I th but the thing about Boltmann is he's an incredibly systematic thinker. Um, he, he doesn't write a systematic theology, but his thought process is, is thoroughly integrated. A move he makes in one part of his thinking fundamentally shapes his moves in other parts. So I identified 10 major themes. Um, you might call them his, his doctrines. If you had a systematic theology, you could articulate his systematic theology around those 10 themes. Um, and so I identified them and I ordered them in such a way that it made sense of the logic of his thought. And then, uh, then I go through them, theme by theme. And in doing it in that way, you get a sense of how his mind works, how his theology actually uh, is constructed. And so it, the book isn't meant to be uh, a thorough introduction to Boltmann. You're not going to get uh, you know, lengthy introductions to his major works. You're not going to learn about his history or his biography. What you will learn is you're going to learn to think like Boltmann. You'll be able to, when you, when you read the book, you'll understand this is how Boltmann thinks. This is why he thinks the way he does. Um, and even if I don't agree with it, I can at least appreciate the moves he's making and in that way um, understand him better and learn to, learn to appreciate his contributions. So I'm um, in college, uh, I was an English major. In a course on European literature, we read um, Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. And in that work, you know, there's some references to Boltmann there. Um, that was an initial inclination that I was curious about what was going on. Um, and I found myself captivated by Bonhoeffer at the point, at that moment. I went off to seminary um, and started reading Eberhard Jungel uh, very heavily. Uh, and so in there, of course, Jungel is, is thoroughly engaged in dialogue with Boltmann. And so there's, again, I saw this name who was kind of lurking in the background of these texts I was reading. Um, finally, it was a couple point, a couple things. Uh, Benjamin Myers had an article on Boltmann that was fascinating to me. And then I took a course my first year as a PhD student with um, our professor of homiletics at Princeton Seminary, um, James Kay. And uh, he gave me these, you know, he gave me these assignments to read Boltmann heavily. So I had a whole independent study with him. And what I, I what I found throughout the, those years of, you know, reading about him and finally reading Boltmann. Um, was that the, the ideas that I had associated in my mind with Boltmann were clearly false. Um, that the text I was reading didn't match the account I had been given in textbooks or in lectures. And that, m that made me realize that I needed to, to read him for myself and to investigate what was actually going on there. Um, and then as I got deeper and deeper into it, it became clear to me that Boltmann uh, connected with me in ways that I had suppressed. I, when I left uh, college, I had sort of um, suppressed my evangelical identity <laughs> and, and kind of wanted to embrace the, you know, something bardy and something, you know, something different, you know, where I was getting rid of my pietist evangelical baggage. Um, and Boltmann re showed me a way to embrace that evangelical identity without losing an inch on, on radical critical fidelity to, to historical scholarship, to theological critique, uh, all of those elements that I thought were in competition with something that appreciated something more evangelical, something missionary, something you know, uh, even pietistic. Uh, those things I thought were in opposition to historical analysis and critical thought, uh, Boltmann helped me to reconcile them. And so when, that, when I realized that was possible, um, that was the kind of clicking point for me that Boltmann was, uh, was somebody worth really engaging.
So two of the big ones are, uh, first, that he's a Heideggerian theologian. Uh, everyone associates Bultmann with Heidegger. It's kind of the, it's a trope. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, in the English-speaking world, Bultmann's reception w- was through a few major thinkers, John Macquarie, uh, Super Ogden, uh, Garrett Jones. So these, these English-language scholars of Bultmann um, interpreted Bultmann in a Heideggerian way, um, in some cases even criticizing Bultmann for not being Heideggerian enough. Uh, but point, but going in the right direction. And that thoroughly shaped the conversation about Bultmann in North America. Um, a, as a result of that, it was just it became assumed that he is the Christian translation of Heidegger you know, in, into, into theology. Um, I, I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think that's entirely misguided. I think that's misguided on, on multiple levels, but uh, I'll, I'll just identify how I approach it. Uh, f- there's three aspects. One is uh, Bultmann's theology, his, ex- his existential theology, is already fully formed in its essential pieces before he ever encounters Heidegger. That's, a, that's, a, that's piece number one. Number two is when he does embrace Heidegger, he does so, he circumscribes Heidegger. That is to say, uh, he has a way of, of taking on Heidegger's thought, his concepts, while without giving an inch to Heidegger in, in terms of the content of his thinking. So he, B- Boltmann has a distinction between form and content. So he takes on formal concepts, whether it's from Heidegger or from uh, history of religions research or wherever it might be. And he, he takes bits and pieces from whatever he's reading and then he uh, orders it and structures it and, and kind of you know, fills it with new content uh, from theology. And that's what he's doing with Heidegger all the way through. And he acknowledges that very clearly, um, that he's appropriating Heidegger to, to address a certain idea. Uh, but the content he acknowledges is in opposition to Heidegger's own thinking, um, that he's, he's actually contradicting Heidegger at a certain fundamental level, even while taking on Heidegger's own thought, thoughts, concepts, and ideas. So that's part number two. And the, and the part three is that the whole taking on of Heidegger, he acknowledges, is just a momentary contemporary translation of theology that will have to be redone again in the future. So there's, he already points beyond Heidegger and his thinking to something else. And so in the next generation, somebody else will have to appropriate a different kind of thought form or different kind of concept. So Heidegger is, is at the beginning, middle, and end of Bultmann's thinking, not essential to Bultmann's own thought. So that's one area where I think uh, a big mis- misconception is present. Uh, a second one would be uh, that Boltmann is um, anthropocentric. And this is very common nowadays, uh, particularly. This is the most common criticism, I would say, in the current literature. And, and the, the concern here, and it's a valid one, is um, does Boltmann's thought collapse God into the, into the self? Does it make theology just a species of anthropology? There are definitely phrases in Boltmann that would suggest that this is, this is the case. But some of it trades on a misconception or misreading of Bultmann. There's a, a famous phrase from one of his early essays where he says, uh, it's something to the effect of, you know, talk of God um, is always at the same time talk of oneself. Now, you can read that and say, oh, talk of God is just talk of oneself. But the at the same time phrase is there and it's really important. And he, and he returns to it repeatedly. It's this simultaneity of talk of God and talk of oneself. They, they occur simultaneously, but it's not a collapse of one into the other, either, either direction. Um, so it's a critique of both those who uh, collapse theology into some sort of speculative, scholastic talk of an abstract deity, but it's also a critique of collapsing God into the self, so we're just talking about the human person. It's, he's trying to have a dialectical simultaneity uh, of both at the same time. Uh, and that's because he's convinced that we can only speak truly and rightly of God if we're speaking about the way in which we are encountered by God. So it's this existential encounter and confrontation with God that makes it possible for us to even talk about God. Um, so he's holding this God talk in continuity with this existential self talk. Um, and, and to lose one side or the other is to miss misconstrue the whole thing and actually to lose both God and the self. Um, so it's, it's, it's very nuanced, it's subtle, but uh, it's an important distinction to hold on to. If you lose the dialectic, you lose everything for Boltmann. Um, 
I would say today we are seeing uh, the dominance of what I would call post-liberalism. I mean post-liberalism in the very in the most broad sense um, as a movement of thought that um, is making sp uh, wants to make space for the church to be an alternative to the world uh, in, in some regard. And that can take a lot of different forms. It can take, um, it, this takes the form of retrieval theologies where we're retrieving uh, the history of the church as a norm for the church today. Um, it takes the form of ecclesiocentric theologies where we make um, the church an alternative culture or polis that, that has, presents a, a different alternative way of life. Um, uh, but all, and all, you know, it's very, uh, there's variations on this all throughout uh, the literature. Um, Boltmann represents a profound critique of that whole way of thinking. Um, and I think uh, it's maybe even more relevant today than it was then. I mean, Boltmann was attacking a certain kind of liberalism at the time, um, uh, which, which had done the same kind of uh, approach with politics and the social, so social system of his day. But I think the post-liberalism of our time is guilty of a similar kind of problem. And Boltmann's critique represents a challenge today just as much as it did back then. Um, so, for example, uh, Boltmann wants to insist that the kerygma, the, this word of God, this gospel, um, is an event. And it cannot be uh, conflated with or turned into a, a, a social program or a, a culture, uh, some kind of, of narrative um, that we can both grasp, but more importantly, um, identify with a specific cultural way of life or life world. Um, for Boltmann, it's, it's crucially important that the kerygma is capable of being communicated across cultural co uh, contexts. Um, it, can, it, can, it can navigate and migrate beyond cultural boundaries. Um, it's not locatable and, and fixed with any sort of cultural system or, or structure. So there isn't any culture that is, that is more, you know, more uh, gospel or Christian uh, than another, but rather the gospel presents an, a, an internal challenge to every system and every structure. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of dialectical remove that the kerygma has uh, with respect to the world. And that's important for, for a lot of reasons, but it has big implications for ecclesiology for how we think about the church, um, how we understand the relationship between the church as an institution in the world with the what we might call the reign or kingdom of God as a, as an, a, a norm or ideal for the, for the people of God. So th these kinds of, of issues are, are prevalent in political theologies and in various uh, narrative theologies that, that um, Boltmann presents uh, a critique but also a challenge to them. And uh, I think it's relevant today as it ever was.